welcome to my YouTube channel. Yes, I'm trying YouTube. Um, if you know me, you probably don't, but if you do, you know me as Hanny Joy from Twitch. So, hello, welcome. If you didn't know I have a Twitch channel, go and check me out at Twitch. Um, I'm going to be trying this out for a little while. I'm going to try and post videos every Sunday. Please let me know what you think of them. This took so much time. I couldn't believe how long it took. My applause to all the YouTubers ever. Um, enjoy guys and tell me what you think of it. Hi guys. Welcome to the first video in my new series of true crime build time. Well, I guess this is kind of my first video full stop. <laughs> but anyway, today we're building a college dorm. It's based loosely off the dorm Maura Murray, a 21 year old who went missing in 2004, lived in. While we're building it, we're going to discuss her case and the people involved in her life and what happened on the night that she disappeared. But I have to warn you, this is a really bizarre case and it doesn't have a proper resolution. Okay, let's get started. Maura Murray was born on May 4th, 1982 in Massachusetts. Her parents are Fred and Laurie Murray. Fred is said to be dedicated to his children, heavily invested in their lives. Some people say that he was Maura's best friend, her hero. Other people say that he was scary and intimidating and put a lot of pressure on Maura and her sister Julie, who was also a track star like Maura was. I don't know much about her mum, Laurie. She was unable to attend most of the things that happened after Maura's disappearance because she was hurt and she's unfortunately since passed away. She actually died on Maura's birthday. Fred and Laurie had three older children, Fred Jr, Kathleen and Julie, and after Maura they had one more child, a son called Kurt. They divorced when Maura was six and even though Maura lived with her mum, she had a really strong bond with her father. He coached sports teams, he took her hiking, and once she moved to college and was legal age, he visited her all the time and he would take her to brew pubs for meals. Maura graduated from Whitman Hanson Regional High School and she was a star athlete. She ran track and cross country, she played soccer and lacrosse. She was also really dedicated to her studies and was on the Dean's List. And when she graduated, she got given $400 because of this. Her track career was so impressive that when she finished high school, she was scouted by Harvard and the United States Milica Military Academy in West Point. She decided on West Point, where she studied chemical engineering and it was there that she met her boyfriend, Billy. After three semesters at West Point, Maura was expelled for conduct unbecoming. It later came out that she'd stolen approximately $5 worth of makeup. Although Billy would claim in 2020 that Maura wasn't actually asked to leave and had decided to transfer. Maura transferred to the University of Massachusetts Amherst to study nursing. She and Billy continued their relationship long distance, and they spent most of their holidays together. In late 2002, they told Billy's mother that they'd started discussing getting married. Maura had one other brush with the law in 2003. She claimed that she found a credit card receipt in the trash and used the number off the bottom. She used this number to purchase approximately $250 worth of food on different occasions. She'd order pizza and subs and have them delivered to her dorm room. The card actually belonged to her roommate. The police came to her dorm one day, they took a statement from her, and they took a photo of her outside her dorm. A lot of people think that she was arrested, but apparently she wasn't even though she ended up on probation for that offence. The first 21 years of Maura's life belonged to her and to those who knew her. 
Her life since February 9th, 2004, however, has belonged to police officers, search participants, and armchair sleuths all over the globe. That's because, on February 9th, 2004, Maura got in her car and drove away from her university campus, and she never returned. To better understand what happened to Maura that night, although, unfortunately, we might never have a full picture of what really did go on, we need to start a few days before Maura went missing. On the evening of February 5th, Maura was working as a security guard on campus when she broke down at work. A co-worker approached her because she was crying and the co-worker said she found Maura in what she called a catatonic state. Maura was supposed to be signing visitors into the dorm, however she was letting people walk past without engaging with them. When the co-worker asked Maura what was wrong, she pointed at her phone and said, My sister. At approximately 1.20am, the co-worker walked Maura home and gave her her phone number and a hug. She expressed to Maura that she was worried about leaving her alone, but Maura told her it was okay because she had a roommate. Maura, in fact, lived in a single room and didn't have a roommate. It was also later discovered that Maura spoke to her boyfriend that night at about two, uh, 20 past 12, but nobody knows what the call was about. After the co-worker dropped Maura back, she called their supervisor and expressed her concerns. The supervisor thanked her for walking Maura home, and that was that. In later interviews, Maura's older sister Kathleen would tell the police that she had spoken to Maura that night, and they'd talked about problems she was having with her fiancé, Tim. And Kathleen admitted to Maura that when Tim had picked her up from her most recent stint in rehab, he'd driven her directly to the liquor store. Maura wasn't the only person having difficulties on campus on the evening of February 5th. Patrice Vassy, who was another Amherst student, was found by police at 12.30am, unconscious on the side of the road. Patrice was in hospital for over a month, in what he calls a comatose condition, where he could hear people but couldn't respond. Patrice had injuries that could have been related either to being struck by or thrown from a car. While he has no memory of the accident, and in fact can only remember drinking with a friend earlier that evening and then waiting for another friend to pick him up, Patrice thinks it's most likely that he was hit rather than thrown from a vehicle. He said there was only one person he would have gotten in a car with that night, and that person visited him in the hospital the next day, and he doesn't think they had anything to do with it. Patrick was the third student to be injured in a hit-and-run that academic year, and he spent years recovering from his accident. But why am I telling you about this? Some people believe that it was actually Mora leaving work on a break to maybe pick up a coffee or run a quick errand that hit Patrice, and maybe she was even on the phone to her boyfriend when this happened. Patrice himself, years later, would say that he thought this was very unlikely. The next thing of note that happens in Maura's case is her father visiting over the weekend. Fred made the nearly two hour drive one that Maura's boyfriend Billy would claim Fred made almost every weekend to Maura's college campus. He stopped at multiple ATM machines and withdrew approximately $4,000 on the way. He told investigators he was taking Maura car shopping, although many of her friends have claimed Maura hadn't shared this information with them, and Fred apparently couldn't tell investigators what had happened to the $4,000. According to Maura's father, he took Maura car shopping, and they did in fact find a new car for Maura. However, they didn't end up purchasing it that weekend, and had planned on getting it the following weekend when Fred visited again. On the evening of February 7th, Fred took Maura and one of her friends, Kate, out to dinner, and then drove them to a liquor store to buy alcohol for a party they were attending. The party was in the dorm of one of Maura's friends, Sara, later that night. Fred told investigators he actually got impatient with the girls and told them to hurry up and make a decision while they were inside the liquor store. Maura and Kate dropped Fred back at his motel because Fred didn't want Maura driving her car. He said it was unsafe. 
so they borrowed his car to go to the party. What happens after this is a little bit fuzzy. Both Kate and Sarah have been relatively uncooperative with police, and neither girl has been able to name other people who were at the party that night. While police managed to speak to some people who were there, no one's ever come forward publicly and talked about it. At approximately 2.30am, Maura told someone at the party that she had to leave to return her father's car to his motel room. Apparently people told her not to go and that it was too late at night to do this, so Maura eventually told them she was going to go back to her dorm. However, she still intended on taking her father's car back first. Some of the party guests claimed that Maura left the party alone, but others say she left with a man. There's never been a definitive answer about who this man was, however, there has been mention of the name Stephanos, either a first or last name, and apparently this person is possibly somehow related to Maura's friend Kate. An hour after leaving the party, Maura is involved in a single car accident where she hits a guardrail. It's interesting to note that the drive from the party to her father's motel, where she was apparently headed, was only 10 minutes. Police arrived at the scene, however Maura was not arrested and caught a ride with the tow truck driver to her father's motel. She didn't have a key for her father's room, so she waited in the reception, where some people say she slept for a while before somebody on the staff let her into her dad's room. Fred claims he didn't notice Maura had come into the room until he woke up the next morning. While she was in her father's room, Maura called her boyfriend, Billy, using Fred's phone. Billy takes the call sometime after 4.30am and calms down a very upset Maura. Billy promises he'll call Maura back in the morning. Now might be a good time to tell you a little bit more about Maura and Billy's relationship. The pair had been dating since 2001, and depending on who you asked, they either had a very good or very bad relationship. There are accusations of cheating on both sides of the relationship, and some sources say that years after Maura went missing, Billy was fired from a job for his conduct with women in the workplace, and that he's actually currently awaiting trial on a charge that I'm unwilling to repeat without more information. Billy appeared in some of the public appeals for Maura and was involved in searching for her. However, as the years went on, he became less and less involved in the case. It's important to remember here, though, that every person involved in Maura's life is dynamic and a complete person, and the information we get about them is only pertaining to Maura and only pertaining to her being missing. So it's entirely likely that we aren't getting a fair representation of them. During 2020, Billy actually became really active on Reddit and answered countless questions about Maura and her disappearance. And one thing that is abundantly clear from these interactions is that 16 years after she vanished, Billy is still in love with her. Back to the car accident. In the morning, Maura's father, Fred, gets in touch with his insurance company and he finds out that Maura has done more than $10,000 worth of damage to his new car. Maura, obviously, is very upset about this. However, Fred would later say that as far as he was concerned, and I quote, If this is the most trouble this kid ever causes me in 21 years, then I am lucky. I'm a lucky guy. He tells Maura during a phone call on Sunday afternoon that she needs to go to a police station and get three copies of an accident form to fill out. This is the last conversation Maura and Fred have. Police investigation would later uncover a lot of what Maura does on Sunday evening and the morning of the 9th, the day that she disappeared. On Sunday night, Maura looked online for rental properties in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. Her computer activity stops at 4 a.m. She starts looking again on the morning of the 9th and searches for directions to Burlington, Vermont. Maura has visited this area since she was a child. She'd hike the mountains with her dad most summers and sometimes during the winter too. 
She emails Billy at 1.30 in the afternoon and tells him that she loves him and that she's sorry she hasn't called him back yet. She doesn't really feel like talking to anybody. She does, however, make some calls. One of these is to a reservation phone line, but the line wasn't working. So instead of being able to make accommodation reservations, Maura can only listen to the listings available. 13 minutes later, she calls Billy and she says she's sorry she missed him. I'm assuming that there was an attempt from him to phone her between the email she sent and now, and she says that she'll call him later. She does make a call to a woman named Linda. However, we won't find out about this call until months later. Maura's father, Fred, and Billy's mother were frustrated and dissatisfied by the police investigation, so they followed up on their own. Maura's phone was on Billy's plan because he'd purchased the phone for her and also paid for it every month, so they had easy access to her phone records and went through and called everybody she had. They get in contact with this woman, Linda, who, with her husband, owns a condo in New Hampshire that Fred, Maura and Billy had stayed at in 2003. It's the least expensive one in the area. Linda cannot offer much information about this call, as she wasn't contacted until so long after. However, she does know that she didn't rent the condo to Maura, because she would have needed to meet Maura and give her the keys if she had. At some point on Sunday, Maura also visits a friend and returns a lab coat, and some people believe she took the time to pack up her dorm room. For a very long time, it was widely reported that when police searched Maura's room, they found everything in boxes and the art taken off the walls. People also believed she'd printed an email, either to or from Billy, one that talked about an incident of cheating, and placed it on top of the boxes. However, as the years have gone by, this narrative has changed. Maura had only been in her dorm room for a week, so it's very possible that instead of being packed up, she hadn't finished unpacking. And how packed or unpacked she was also seems to be in question. Some people claim boxes were stacked too high on her bed. However, her boyfriend Billy said that when he visited her room after her disappearance, there were some boxes on the floor and a suitcase on the bed. In regards to the email, Billy claims he didn't see one sitting on the boxes, however he did find one, from 2002, between the pages of a book on her desk. He told police about this email at the time. The most confusing thing Maura does on the afternoon of the 9th of February is emailing her professors. She tells them all she'll be out of school for a week, as there's been a death in the family. It had later come out that she had lied, and that everyone in her family was fine. At about 3.30, she got into her Saturn, a car her father had told her she shouldn't be driving due to its condition, the entire reason he'd visited to buy her a new one, and she left campus. Maura stopped in an ATM. Photos from the ATM show Maura, alone, wearing a black jacket that Billy doesn't recognise. She withdraws $280, which is basically everything she has in her account, and then she goes to a liquor store. At the liquor store, she purchases a box of wine, a bottle of vodka, Kahlua, a bottle of Baileys, and it was later reported that she may have also purchased a six-pack of pre-mixed drinks. The only other stop Maura makes is at a gas station. When her car was found, the petrol tank was almost completely full. After 4pm, Maura uses her cell phone to call her dorm phone and check her voicemails. It's the last documented use of her phone. At 7.27pm on February 9th, 2004, a woman living near Woodsville, New Hampshire, a small village near the town of Haverhill, called police and reported a car accident. It was dark, the road was icy, and a car had come around the corner near the old barn, the old barn will become a landmark of Moore's disappearance, and spun off the road. It was now facing the wrong direction. Police dispatchers asked her if she knew if anyone was hurt, and she said she didn't know. She could see activity near the boot of the car, and a man in the car was smoking a cigarette. That man will never be mentioned again. Shortly after this phone call was made, a local resident, bus driver Butch Atwood, comes across the scene. 
he sees and speaks to Mora. Although, when initially shown photos of Mora by the police, Butch said that wasn't her. Many people think this is because she had her hair down and was dishevelled and possibly intoxicated. Later on, after looking over photos for a period of time, Butch confirmed that it was Mora he saw that night. He says Mora wasn't bleeding and didn't seem intoxicated to him, but she was visibly shaken by the crash. He offered to call police for her and asked if she'd like to get in his bus and drive to his house, a short drive up the road, so that she could stay warm while she waited. It was approximately zero degrees Celsius that night, and although it wasn't snowing at the time, it had recently. Maura declined Butch's offer of help and asked him not to call the police. She said she'd phoned AAA, and she did have long-distance towing cover, something Billy's family had purchased for her as they were concerned about her car breaking down while she was driving to nursing practicals. Butch has always said that he knew she hadn't called AAA, though, as there was no cell phone reception in the area at the time. He arrived home 15 minutes later and parked his bus in a different spot than usual. Typically, he parked it on the road, alongside his live-in girlfriend's bus, as the state had put a light on the street for them to park safely. However, he parked up against the house. He said he did this so that he could sit in the bus and see the crash site. His living girlfriend called police about the incident, and Butch stayed in the bus until law enforcement walked up the road to talk to him. Butch has long speculated that Maura didn't take up his offer because he's an overweight, dishevelled man, but maybe that she might have taken up a similar offer from someone more clean-cut. Over the years, a lot of people have also speculated that Maura didn't want the police at the scene because she'd been drinking and driving and was on probation which is why she might have lied about calling AAA. At 7.46pm, law enforcement arrived at the scene of the crash to find the car locked and Maura nowhere to be seen. It had only been 20 minutes since the crash had been reported, and even less time since Butch had spoken to Maura. The windshield of the Saturn was broken on the driver's side, and the airbags had gone off. The front end was damaged, and officers at the scene could see a box of wine behind the driver's seat through a window. There was a pink substance in the snow behind the car that looked like it had been poured out, and a coke bottle was also found near the car that law enforcement claimed smelled like alcohol. The exhaust of the car had a rag stuffed in it, which at first seemed very suspicious. However, Maura's father, Fred, said he'd told her to do that because the exhaust was giving out lots of smoke. He said if she had to drive the car, she should put a rag in the exhaust. Police ended up removing the entire exhaust system from the car. A search of the scene that night didn't turn up anything suspicious looking. There was no signs of a struggle, and because the car was locked and it looked like the driver had been drinking, police believed that she'd left the scene under her own power in order to avoid officers, and that she'd return tomorrow, maybe, to sort everything out. It wasn't until they contacted her family the next day that anybody became concerned about Maura's whereabouts. When first spoken to by police, Maura's father, Fred, said he was worried Maura was depressed about the earlier accident she'd had in his car and that she might have driven up to the mountains to hurt herself. He later said he regretted saying this and doesn't believe Maura had any intention of committing suicide. He said she had a good life. She was doing well in school and sports and had friends and a boyfriend. She had so many reasons to live. Maura's friends and boyfriend also don't believe she was leaving to hurt herself or not return. Only a few days earlier, she'd sent an email to her hometown friends talking about a Dean Cook concert she'd missed, and how she'd found out there was going to be another one in three days after the day she went missing. She was planning on attending that concert. Maura's voicemail had a phone call that was placed some time after her crash. In it, somebody was breathing heavily and whimpering before the call ended. Maura's boyfriend, Billy, also received a similar voicemail. He was going through airport security and missed a call. When he checked it later, he could hear someone sobbing softly, shivering and whimpering. At the time, he claimed he was sure it was Maura, 
He tried calling the number back and it was a prepaid calling card. Billy's family had given Maura two prepaid calling cards over a recent holiday break. Maura's friends and family swarmed to the scene of the accident to look for her. In the days that followed, there's no evidence found that Maura walked into the woods after the crash. This will, however, become a popular theory about her disappearance. Sniffer dogs are used and one alerts to a scent. It follows the scent a hundred feet and stops in the middle of the road. Many people claim that the reason the scent stopped suddenly is because Maura got into a car. However, the dogs weren't used until days after Maura went missing, and Fred has always claimed that the clothing item they used was too new. Officers used a glove that Maura had been given for Christmas, and Fred claimed she hadn't used it that much. Her family strongly believed that if Maura could contact them, she would, so they started making public appeals for her return. They told her that they loved her, and that she shouldn't be afraid to come back. Her dad, in particular, said on television that no matter what it was, they would fix it, just like they always did. During one of the searches, Maura's sister found women's underwear. This was turned over to police, who said they forensically tested it, and those tests concluded the underwear wasn't Maura's. This, is, this item of clothing will not be the first item of interest the family hand over to police and then hear nothing else about. Fred is incredibly unhappy about how the investigation is being handled. He wants the FBI to take over, or for police to give him all the information they have about Maura. The police refuse. So Fred files a lawsuit against the state police, trying to get the documentation. The courts rule that the records cannot be released to the public, because it could interfere with future police activity. Police and Fred will continue to have a contentious relationship. After searching Maura's car and removing her exhaust system, her belongings are released to Billy. Billy brings these things to his mother's house, and they go through them. In Maura's car, they found a bag with running clothes in it, a number of nursing textbooks, and one of her favourite books, Not Without Peril, which is about hikers who'd never returned or been injured on trails. Fred said it was in her car because they climbed Mount Washington, and the book mentions trails that would gone on together. Many people claim that the running gear in the textbooks are proof that Maura had no intention of hurting herself or running away. Why would you take your homework if you had no intention to return? Police also found a receipt from the liquor store, which is how they knew what she'd purchased. However, they didn't find all the alcohol that was on the receipt. There have been a number of reported sightings of Maura since this day. However, the police have followed them up and concluded that none of them are confirmed or credible. One such sighting was shared by a reporter who spoke to a witness who believes she saw Maura, a young woman with an older man in his 60s. The young woman had her hands folded in front of her and was mouthing, help me, but before the woman realised what was happening, they left. The witness didn't get license plate numbers or a description of the man, but she was sure the woman was Maura. There are also apparently other witnesses who claim they've been silenced or have been intimidated into keeping what they saw that night to themselves. Some of these people have come out over the years and their reports of what they saw have brought new theories and new suspects to light. So, what did happen to Maura Murray? All we can be certain of is that for a time she was here and now she isn't. But there's no shortage of theories interlaced with speculation and gossip, like the idea that Maura might have been pregnant or had a secret boyfriend who she'd recently broken up with. The people who loved Maura also constantly cast as suspicious. Her father, her boyfriend Billy, her sister, and her sister's partner Tim, even her friend Kate. There's theories that a group of young men going skiing took her, or that she was murdered in a suspicious A-frame house where blood was found years later. Some people think the bus driver, Butch, did it, or that a local police officer did. Some people think she killed herself, or ran away. Others speculate that she was drunk, confused, and ran into the woods where she died of exposure. Maybe we'll never know what happened. For most people that walk into the case, they start to scratch the surface and then continue to dig deeper and find all the complexities of the life of a 21-year-old who was described as multifaceted, of a serious, 
studious and athletic young person who loved her boyfriend and family, but was also the type of person to get on a bus one day in high school and go to Boston without telling anyone. We all have our theories. So tell me, what do you think happened to Maura Murray? And obviously, if you have any information you think could be helpful in bringing closure to Maura's friends and family, and I guess in a wider sense, all of us, please contact the police. Or if you'd like to stay anonymous, get in contact with your local Crime Stoppers organization. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something new, maybe a lot of new things about this case. Maura Murray was the first real true crime case that caught my eye, and I think it is for a lot of people. We really only scratched the surface today, and there's so much more I could tell you. I'm going to leave some links with resources so that you can do digging of your own if you like, and I'll be back next week with another video going a little deeper into the case. Let me know if there's anything specific you'd like to learn about it. I appreciate all of you. I think you're the bee's knees. Don't forget to wash your hands, be kind to yourselves, love one another, and always, always trust your gut.